And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. Once man looked to God and higher beings to understand his nature and origin. According to Genesis, God created man and woman from the dust of the earth about 6,000 years ago. But when man started to dig in the dust of the earth, he found bones and implements that appeared to tell another story, evolution. These ideas were formulated by Charles Darwin in his book, Origin of Species. In this book, Darwin did not say much about human evolution, only that much light would be thrown on the origin of man and his history. This brief remark set off a revolution in thought, and by the 1870s, the belief in the origin of man by evolution from ape-like ancestors had become dominant among scientists and academics throughout the Western world. In the years following the publication of The Origin of Species, various scientists began drawing family trees, showing how the human species evolved from lower animals. This particular tree was drawn by the German naturalist Ernst Haeckel. The only problem with this picture was that there was precious little evidence to support it. At first, they had only Neanderthal man to fill in the gaps, too human-like and too recent to be a missing link. But scientists committed to Darwinian evolution expected that fossils of a genuine ape-man, sufficiently ancient, would soon be found. In fact, Haeckel commissioned this painting, showing exactly how he should appear. He called him Pithecanthropus alelis, the speechless ape-man. And scientists were not disappointed. Fossils said to represent a whole series of intermediates were discovered over the next several decades. Here is the picture that emerged. In 1894, the Dutch physician Eugene Dubois discovered a primitive skull and thigh bone in Java, thus realizing the dream of Haeckel's Pithecanthropus alelis. Today, Java man, along with Peking man and other specimens, is known as Homo erectus. Homo erectus is thought to have lived from 1.6 million to 300,000 years ago. Modern man, represented by Cro-Magnon man, is thought to have first appeared about 40,000 years ago. Neanderthal man, now generally thought to be an offshoot from the main line of human evolution, existed from 150,000 to 35,000 years ago. In the 1920s, a South African scientist found the first specimen of the creature now called Australopithecus, a small, erect, ape-like being thought to represent the human lineage at two to three million years ago. In the 1950s, Lewis and Mary Leakey discovered Homo habilis, an intermediate between Australopithecus and Homo erectus. According to the current scenario, the initial stages of evolution from Australopithecus to Homo erectus took place in Africa. Homo erectus then left Africa and spread widely throughout the tropical and temperate latitudes of the Old World. Somewhere in this broad region, it is believed Homo erectus evolved into Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens completely replaced Homo erectus and moved on into the northern regions of the Old World. No more than 20,000 years ago, Homo sapiens is thought to have crossed into North America and populated the New World. This is the standard scenario of human evolution. But over the past 150 years, much evidence has been discovered that radically contradicts this picture. At all ages in this picture of fossil history, and even earlier, scientists have found evidence for the presence of Homo sapiens. What is this evidence, and why have so few people heard of it? 
First of all, we should understand that our whole picture of man's prehistoric past is based on four kinds of physical evidence. Stone tools, incised bones, human skeletal remains, and other artifacts. A stone tool like this one from a site in Toralba, Spain, may look like an ordinary rock, but experts in lithic technology can identify the chipping and fracturing as the product of human work. In a similar fashion, experts can tell the difference between marks made by animal teeth and those made by flint tools on fossil bones. This cut bone was found at a Cro-Magnon site. This Cro-Magnon skeleton was unearthed in France during the 19th century. Most paleoanthropologists would not expect such skeletons of modern human type to be older than 40,000 years. Scientists interested in human prehistory also study artifacts such as paintings, statues, carvings, and pottery, which they tend to regard as very recent. But now, let's investigate the large body of evidence in these categories that contradicts the modern picture of man's origins, starting with that found in Europe. In the 1850s, Carlos Ribeiro, the head of the Geological Survey of Portugal, found these tools in the Miocene strata of the Tagus River Valley near Lisbon. To get some idea of the astounding age of Ribeiro's discoveries, let's look at a chart of the geological ages. The Miocene extends from 5 to 25 million years ago. At present, the most primitive accepted stone tools all lie within the Pleistocene, being at most 2 million years old. Tools of the type discovered by Ribeiro in Miocene formations are generally found in the upper Pleistocene and are characteristic of fully modern man. At present, Extinct apes are the highest primates assigned to the Miocene. Then what made Ribeiro's tools? Are they really artifacts, or are they products of nature? Let's compare Ribeiro's tool with an accepted stone tool made by Neanderthal man in the late Pleistocene, less than 100,000 years ago. On both, large flakes were removed in parallel, something not likely to occur in the course of random battering by natural forces. The opposite sides of both pieces display additional features typical of human work, such as the bulb of percussion caused by a single directed blow that removed the flake from a flint core, the striking platform, the surface upon which the blow was struck, the aurelior, a small chip removed from the bulb of percussion. In every respect, Ribeiro's Miocene tools resemble those accepted by scientists as the product of human work. Despite such evidence, many scientists resisted the conclusion that human beings manufactured tools in the Miocene. At an international congress of archaeology and anthropology held in Lisbon in 1871, a commission of scientists was appointed to examine the sites of Ribeiro's discoveries. One member of this commission, the Italian geologist J. Bellucci, found this tool in Miocene strata. All the scientists present agreed it was identical to late Pleistocene scraping tools. This led some to claim that it was indeed a late Pleistocene tool that had been washed into a Miocene formation from above. But the tool was found firmly embedded in the upper surface of an overhanging section of the Miocene layers. Stone tools, even older than those of Portugal, were found by the Abbé Bourgeois at Tenay in France. Many of the tools were found embedded in undisturbed Oligocene formations, and this indicates an age of from 25 to 38 million years. Especially noteworthy is the retouching on the edges of the implements. This retouching is confined to one side of the working edge of the implement. It is obvious that several small flakes have been removed in succession, and most are oriented in the same general direction. Such retouching is generally regarded as a sure sign of intentional work. The implements from the Oligocene of today display the same features as this accepted scraper from an upper Pleistocene site in France. Here are more examples of unifacially retouched implements from the Oligocene at Tenay reproduced from 19th century scientific journals. At another site near Aurillac in southern France, 
Several scientists recovered stone implements from Miocene formations during the 19th century. In 1905, the German scientist Max Verborn sought to confirm these discoveries by conducting his own excavations at Oralac. He personally recovered these implements from Miocene formations there. Here, the cortex, or outer surface of the flint, has been removed from the working edges, which have been carefully chipped to form a point. Scientists such as Henry Bruhl sought to prove the natural origin of such implements. An excavation near Clermont in France, Bruhl found specimens like these, with small chips of flint lying close to the parent blocks, apparently removed by geological pressure. Because this occurred in an Eocene formation, Bruhl believed human work of any kind could be ruled out. He was convinced human beings could not have existed from 38 to 55 million years ago. On the basis of this preconception, he concluded that all of the flints resembling tools found in the same Eocene stratum had also been formed by geological pressure, including this one. And this one. In fact, Bruhl said that it was stupefying to find in an Eocene formation an implement such as this, which he said looked exactly like a late Pleistocene tool made by Homo sapiens. But here is an important fact. Specimens of this level of sophistication were not found with the chips in place. Just because geological pressure might have produced effects like this does not mean it can produce implements like this, complete with wear marks in the appropriate places. It would thus appear that Bruhl found a genuine human artifact in an Eocene formation. On the coast of East Anglia in England, J. Reed Moore and other researchers reported several intriguing discoveries. This pointed piece of wood was recovered from the Cromer forest bed in East Anglia. The right end has been cut off flat, as if by sawing. The Cromer forest bed formation dates to the latter part of the early Pleistocene and is about 1 to 1.5 million years old. J. Reed Moore noted that at one spot it seems that the line of cutting has been corrected, as is often necessary when sawing. It is hard to see how such sawing could have been accomplished without tools considered quite modern. Another discovery was this carved shell, presented in 1881 by geologist Henry Stopes to the British Association for the Advancement of Science. It was recovered from the Red Crag Formation, which is 1.5 to 2 million years old. It may be recalled that according to standard opinion, human beings capable of such work did not appear in Europe before 40,000 years ago. Below the Red Crag Formation is a layer called the detritus bed, lying upon the Eocene London clay. It is composed of fossils and sediments from the Pliocene, Miocene, and Oligocene periods. Anything found here could be anywhere from 2 to 38 million years old. J. Reed Moore recovered these bone implements from the detritus bed below the Red Crag. The fractures that form the points go across the natural grain of the bone, indicating intentional work rather than natural breakage. Also discovered in the detritus bed was this round object, characterized by Henry Bruhl, one of Europe's leading experts on prehistoric man, as a slingstone, similar to those used recently in New Caledonia. The slingstone was apparently fashioned from a clay-like substance, and its surface shows many parallel striations indicating shaping with some sort of implement. If the current view of human evolution is accepted, it is difficult to explain what sort of being might have made this object at least two million and perhaps as much as 38 million years ago. In Middle Miocene marine formations on the northwest coast of France, the Abbe de Launay discovered this bone from a halotherium, an extinct sea mammal. It bears what appear to be the cut marks of a sharp implement. Similar markings are found on this whalebone, recovered by Jean Capolini from a Pliocene formation in Italy. These cut marks are distinct from those that might be made by teeth. A tooth scraping over the surface of a bone typically leaves a U-shaped depression, crushing rather than cutting the bone. On the other hand, a sharp flint blade would leave a narrow V-shaped incision, such as found on the bones in question. In his original report, published in the 1870s, 
Capolini provided this magnified cross-section of a cut mark on one of his fossil whale bones. Capolini's methodology was as sophisticated as that used by modern scientists. Thus far, we have been considering stone tools, cut bones, and other artifacts that indicate the presence of man in very ancient times. One might ask if there are any human skeletal remains from the same period. The answer is yes. In the year 1860, at Castanodolo, Italy, on the southern flanks of the Alps, G. Ragazzoni, a professor of geology, discovered human fossils in a hillside excavation at the bottom of a five-foot thick layer of blue Pliocene clay. Ragazzoni carefully examined the overlying layers and determined they were undisturbed. In 1880, the bones of a fully human man and a child were discovered some yards away, at the same depth. Ragazzoni again inspected the overlying layers and found them undisturbed. A short time later, the bones of a woman were found at a slightly higher level. The overlying layers of yellow sand and red clay were undisturbed. This ruled out the possibility the bones may have been introduced into the Pliocene clay by burial from above. The reconstructed skull of the woman is fully human and provides excellent evidence for Homo sapiens in northern Italy over two million years ago. According to modern theory, present-day Homo sapiens came into being only 40,000 years ago. Leaving Europe, we now turn our attention to discoveries in other parts of the world. In 1894, Dr. Fritz Nordling, a paleontologist with the Geological Survey of India, found this implement in the Miocene Formation in Burma. Dr. Nordling commented that if this tool were to be rejected as the product of natural forces, then almost all the recognized stone tools from later periods should also be rejected. In the early part of this century, some Argentine scientists discovered stone tools in the Pliocene Formation at Miramar, on the coast of Argentina, just south of Buenos Aires. The formation contained bones of typical Pliocene mammals, making it over two million years old. But the Argentine researcher, Antonio Romero, insisted that the formation was quite recent, and that the Pliocene animal bones had been washed in from elsewhere. Carlos Amagino, however, found in natural connection the bones of the whole rear leg of a Pliocene species of Toxodon, an extinct South American mammal. But this is not likely to have occurred simply by the random movement of the bones in the currents of streams. If the bones really belong together, that means that a Pliocene animal died in that place and that the formation really is two to five million years old, as are the stone tools found there. And here is a further interesting fact. Carlos Amagino found embedded in the Toxodon femur a stone arrowhead, more evidence for the presence of technologically sophisticated human beings over two million years ago in Argentina. This fully human skull was discovered in 1896 by workmen excavating a dry dock in the harbor of Buenos Aires. It was found in the rudder pit of the dry dock at a depth of about 35 feet below the bottom of the river, just after the workmen broke through a hard limestone-like layer of Tosca. The sediments in which the skull was found are 1.5 to 2.5 million years old. Some might object that no scientist was present at the moment of discovery by the workmen. But workmen also discovered the Heidelberg jaw, which is fully accepted as an example of Homo erectus in the middle Pleistocene of Europe. In the 1850s, miners first panned for gold in the gravels of California rivers. Later, they dug mine shafts at places like Table Mountain in Tuolumne County in order to get at the gold-bearing gravels. The gravels were originally deposited in rivers that flowed here millions of years ago during the Miocene period and earlier. At the end of the Miocene, volcanic eruptions covered the entire area with basalt. Then, in more recent times, rivers cut new valleys, leaving formations like Table Mountain with deposits of gold-bearing gravel now buried beneath layers of basalt. In 1877, John H. Neal entered the Montezuma mine shaft at Table Mountain. He proceeded 1,400 to 1,500 feet inside. 
Then at the working end of the shaft, he discovered in the undisturbed gold-bearing gravel this mortar and pestle, along with several stone spearheads. Neil testified he saw no fissures by which the objects could have entered from above. The gold-bearing gravels at Table Mountain date at least to the late Miocene, and therefore the objects found in them would be seven to nine million years old. Some modern geologists say the ancient river channels are from the Eocene period and could thus be as much as 55 million years old. Miners made similar discoveries at dozens of nearby locations. This mortar and pestle were found in 1861 in gold-bearing gravels 16 feet below the surface at Kincaid Flat. These turned up at Gold Spring Gulch. And this, 200 feet inside the Boston Tunnel Company mine at Table Mountain. This interesting object was found in 1864, 16 feet below the surface in gold-bearing gravel at Oregon Bar in Placer County. These examples and many others were reported by J.D. Whitney, the state geologist of California. Nevertheless, some objected that they were all hoaxes by miners. But in 1869, Clarence D. King of the U.S. Geological Survey discovered this pestle firmly in place at Table Mountain. It is shown alongside a modern Indian pestle. The American anthropologist W.H. Holmes rejected the California finds, mainly because they did not fit in with his ideas about evolution. The discovery of Java Man had put an ape man in the middle Pleistocene. So how could you have advanced stone tool making men in the Miocene or Eocene? According to Holmes, it was completely out of the question. Nevertheless, many scientists, most of them evolutionists, had discovered abundant evidence for a human presence in the Pliocene, Miocene and earlier periods. But with the discovery of Java Man and later of Australopithecus, this evidence disappeared from view, mostly because it did not fit into the newly emerging scenario of human evolution. Today, practically no one has even heard of this evidence. If you want to find out about it, you have to dig into obscure 19th century journals in many different languages. Of course, it is possible to point out discrepancies in the evidence that goes against the current theory of human evolution. But the evidence that is said to support this theory is also full of discrepancies. First, let's consider Java Man. Since Dubois made his initial discovery here at Trinil, scientists have made many more finds at other sites in Java. These fossils are now categorized along with the original Java Man as Homo erectus. In 1978, a standard textbook gave the Java Homo erectus fossils potassium argon dates of from 700,000 years to 2 million years ago. A chart in the book lists 24 discoveries. Of these, at least 18, or 75%, were found on the surface or came from unknown locations and are thus unsuitable for potassium argon dating. Fourteen were initially found by native collectors. And four were found in a museum in Holland 30 years after their discovery with no clue to their original stratigraphic location. The potassium argon method does not date the bone itself, but rather is used to test the age of volcanic deposits. Only if a fossil is found beneath an undisturbed layer of volcanic material is it possible to assign it a date using this method. Devastating criticism could have been brought to bear on the Java Man fossils because most were found on the surface at poorly specified locations by paid native collectors, but no such criticism was leveled. Instead, scientists simply dressed up this imperfect evidence with undeserved potassium argon dates that allowed the fossils to be easily fitted into the accepted outline of human evolution. This double standard in the treatment of evidence is a general phenomenon. Let's consider how this process of selective acceptance and rejection of evidence operates in a related field we have already briefly touched upon, the peopling of the new world. 
The view now being vigorously defended is that Homo sapiens crossed over from Siberia not more than 20,000 years ago. Yet scientists have discovered a great deal of evidence suggesting a far more ancient human presence in the New World. Even though this evidence is comparable in quality and quantity to the evidence used to support the dominant view, it is rejected by establishment scientists. For example, in 1899, Ernest Volk, a collector for the Peabody Museum of Natural History at Harvard, found a Homo sapiens femur embedded in glacial strata at Trenton, New Jersey. The layer in which the bone was found is said by the New Jersey Geological Survey to be about 107,000 years old. This small statue, found at Nampa, Idaho in 1889, came from an encased well shaft at a depth of 300 feet. The level at which it was found is now dated by the U.S. Geological Survey as being between 300,000 and 2 million years old. The Nampa image is comparable to the famous Willendorf Venus attributed to Cro-Magnon Man in Europe. Man is not thought to have made such works of art until 30,000 years ago. By the way, the Venus of Willendorf was found by a road workman. This coin-like object was recovered at a depth of over 100 feet from a well boring in Illinois. The Geological Survey of Illinois states that the formation in which it was found is from 200,000 to 400,000 years old. The discovery was initially reported by William E. Dubois of the Smithsonian Institution. In the early 1960s, Lewis Leakey located an early man site at Calico in Southern California with stone tools found in strata dated at 200,000 years old. In succeeding years, thousands of implements have been recovered from the Calico site, including this beaked graver. If scientists are reluctant to modify their view concerning man's entry into the Americas, they are even more hesitant to change their view that modern man first appeared within the past 40,000 years and evolved from ape-like ancestors originating in Africa. Evolutionists pride themselves on having done away with the idea that man was created 10,000 years ago, but not much has changed. The present dominant view is that human beings of modern type still can be dated back only a few thousand years. Before that, there was only primitive man fading off into ape-like life. But this film confronts us with abundant evidence that human beings of modern type have existed for tens of millions of years into the past in geological ages distant from our own. To obtain your copy of The Hidden History of the Human Race, call 1-800-HIDDEN-1 or write to Goverdon Hill Publishing, Post Office Box 52, Badger, California, 93603.